bringing us all here safely. Thank you for blessing us with this opportunity to gather with fellow believers, to grow in our knowledge of you. Please bless this place as we lift up our worship to you. Help us to make a joyful noise. In your name, amen.
still the same. Thank you that you're the same God who did all of those miracles throughout the entire Bible. Thank you that you still have that same power in each and every single one of our lives. Thank you again for bringing us here safely, Lord. Please bless John's preaching as he's up here. Help him to speak your word to each and every one of our hearts and help our hearts be receptive of the truth that he's about to give us. We love you, Lord. 
Amen. 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 everybody. Welcome to Living Water Community Church. Uh, kids, you got to dismiss off the kids' spray. You are new. So thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is John Avery, the pastor here at Living Water. Uh, if you are new, um, you haven't yet had your way out. Uh, there's on the welcome table is some blue uh, cups, and inside the cups, some information about church. I encourage you to grab those on the way out. Also, there is a connect card. You can know, grab those cups, and one probably in front of you. Um, if you are new, you guys just fill that connect card out and drop the offer box in the back. It allows us to connect with you. They ask for any questions about the church or pray with you in any way at all. So please fill that out and drop the offer box. And if you are a regular tender member here, you might be paid to tithe an offering to give. The offering box you can give online at the church. Stop. I mean, all right, a couple quick things. I'm we'll diving the word this morning. Um, first thing is rooted. It's our kind of monthly uh, Bible study that we are starting. It starts uh, February 8th. The doors open at 5:30. The uh, um, the study will start at six o'clock. It runs about an hour, hour and fifteen minutes. Um, it's time for some teaching. Uh, time for ask questions and fellowship. Um, if you're interested, there's a sign up all back. You can just come as well. The topic, the topic, the topic will be different every single month. This month, the topic, the topic is the Trinity, why it matters, and why we believe in the Trinity. So I encourage you to come on to that and dive deeper in God's Word. Uh, two other things, if you have, we are looking for people to start making baked goods once a month. We're starting going to start, instead of, we have donuts every single week. We want to start uh, having a little bit more, make it a little more fun, have uh, some cookies, brownies, and stuff. So if you are willing to make big goods, um, I don't know if there's a sign up out back, but you can probably talk to Karen or, or Dory or on your connect card as well. You can just write, you're interested in making big goods. Um, we'd love to have you serve that way. And also, if you have on your bulletin, you can see this. We need volunteers in every area of our church. So if you're interested in serving, we can definitely use you. Uh, you have different different areas all throughout this church that need help. I have a few listed there. If you are interested, you can, you can sign up on your connect card. Um, and lastly, we do have, right after the service today, um, there's an FCA question information lunch. On the back table, you'll notice there's actually all kinds of FCA uh, stuff. It's all free. So if you want a free t-shirt, or not very many, but um, it's some, but It'll go pretty quick if y'all take those anyways. But um, there's uh, some old back there if you want to grab some stuff on your way out. And I would encourage you to stay after here what FC is doing and how uh, you can be a support to them and how we can pray for them. Yeah, so, yeah. Let's pray. All right, Father God, thank you so much for you, Lord. Thank you for bringing us here this morning. God, I pray that you would uh, pray you'd bless this time that we have together, God, yeah, as we. Uh, fellowship and as we um, are together in this place, Lord, I pray you would encourage us, help us build one another up. Lord, I pray there's unity inside this body, that there will be no division at the end, we would not have to gain a foothold um, inside of this church, Lord, that anything that would just unify us, God, that would be, that would be broken down, Lord. Um, Lord, I also pray for, for those in our congregation that aren't here, for whatever reason, whether they're sick or uh, traveling, God, I just pray you would bring healing and, and safety in their life, Lord. And those that are doing more terrible than those in our church with cancer and um, uh, just pain and injuries and, and whatever they're dealing with, Lord, pray for healing, pray for comfort, pray for peace in their life, God. Um, something only truly you can bring, Lord, in, in this life. Um, and God, I pray for us as a church body as we do, uh, as we are focusing in on, on growth uh, this year for us as a congregation to, to grow, go deeper in you, Lord. Um, but for that, 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 that deepened knowledge of you and, and as we grow closer to you, and I pray that we all will grow closer to you this year, Lord, but, but that, will, that will spur us and lead us to go outside of these walls and to uh, share the gospel and to be a witness for you and to be the light in our community and to see many people come to know you, Lord. Uh, our vision, Lord, is, is, is to see water will transform by the gospel. God, I pray that will happen, that revival would break out, God, that you would use us, use our church, use other churches as well. Lord, I know we're not in this alone. We are, we are uh, these are all, many churches around us that are all doing the same thing, Lord. They're all preaching the gospel and, and have the same vision, Lord. I pray that you would do amazing things, Lord, and we could just be part of it. Oh, my Lord. Um, and God, I pray we be diving the word this morning, we dive in Genesis chapter 2, that you would uh, do the work that I cannot do, and I speak to our hearts, God. I pray you would convict us and challenge us, that the Holy Spirit will uh, mold us today. I pray we leave here different. I'd open our eyes to your word. Help my words drown out. Help your words to 
um, come forth this morning, God, and help us to understand the text, understand what you're trying to say to our hearts. We love you. Just don't pray. Amen. So if you're Bible, you're going to go ahead and open up. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 2 this morning. Um, we're continuing our series. It's called Foundations. And the goal of, a, of this year in 2023 is for us to grow spiritually, uh, for us to hopefully take steps in, in our walk with Christ, uh, to go deeper, to go closer to him. And we believe that by doing this, it will lead us to becoming a better witness in our community for, for us, for as, as our as we go closer to Christ, our, we, we desire, we want this church body, and I believe God wants as well, for our hearts to uh, to change. For us to have a passion and desire for discipleship, for discipling one another, and for us to desire to be disciples. Also, and also a burden for the lost. I want to see our church have a deeper burden for the lost. I think we already have that in our church body, but I want to see it deeper even more. For all of us to have a longing to see our community changed by the gospel. It's a big vision, but I absolutely believe God can do it. But it takes a church body just growing deeper in him, loving him, and pursuing him every day of their life. And that pursuit and that love spurs us out to go with our community and share the gospel. So um, to start this growth journey, where we are going in the Bible is the book of Genesis. And the reason why we're going to the book of Genesis is because it, it lays the foundation, why we call it series foundations, uh, for much of what we know about, about the world, about God, about gospel, about evil and suffering. It all stems from the book of Genesis. Much of scripture kind of looks back to Genesis as a foundation for much of the stuff that we believe and much of the things that happen in the world. So things that just, just that things that we don't really think about, like the, the why we have seven day a week and, and, and why our animals name certain things. And it, so many things in the book of Genesis, book, book of Genesis explain why things are the way they are. So, um, and also what we're doing in this series, um, and maybe this will continue on throughout, and this is something we'll just continue doing. Um, in, in front of you, you see this note card called Burning Questions, um, where basically the reason why we're doing this is because in the book of Genesis, there's a lot of things I'm not going to cover, and a lot of things I'm going to kind of brush over, and things that um, I could go deeper on, but it would take away from, I think, the main point of the text. So um, if you do have any questions about this, this sermon, or any question at all about God, I would encourage you to write it on that burning question, drop me off your box. And uh, right now, I've been doing like one video a week. I do it usually in my office late at night. So, um, but uh, I, I've actually enjoyed doing this. It's been um, fun for me to do. I hope it's been encouraging to you as well uh, to just uh, have your question answered. And just and, and the dialogue, I love the dialogue that it brings, I think, in, in our body. Just with me talking to you, but even on Facebook, I see you guys talking about it. And I think it's great for us to to ponder and think about some deeper things about God, to go deeper, not just a shallow level of Christianity, but to go deeper in God's word and to think about some, some hard topics. So today, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 2. Um, we're in the last part of Genesis 2. Uh, at this point, where we've been in the book of Genesis, um, we went through the sixth day of creation, Genesis chapter 1. Seventh day, God rested. Uh, we talked about what that rest looked like. Last week, we started to focus in on God's unique and special creation, which is us as, as humans. And how God gives us a mission to work the earth, to do it, to have dominion over God's creation. So today, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 2. We're going to focus in on uh, one major foundation that not all of us are a part of, but many of us um, are in right now. So let's read Genesis Chapter 2 of your Bible is going to open up. If you are new with us, we don't put the passage on the screen, so uh, grab a Bible in front of you. Genesis chapter 2, we begin in verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. Now, I want to pause it here just for a moment. The first thing I want us to understand, and I think it's very important to, to grasp here, is I believe we are on still on day six of creation. Now, as Josh explained last week, is that Genesis 1, it kind of gives us a, basically an a overview of creation, right? You have, you have six days of creation. This is what God did each day. And then what Genesis 2 does is it kind of zooms in on, on one of God's special creation. It kind of goes deeper into the creation of man and the creation of woman on the sixth day. So right here, we're still on the sixth day. And why do I believe this, this girl is still on the sixth day? Because on day seven, what, what, what happened? Genesis 2.2, 2, God says that he finished all of his work on the earth. 
So creation was complete at the end of day six. But at the end of day six, when the sun went down, remember the, the, the day ended that day, God was done creating things. The creation was finished at that point. And what did God say when his creation was complete at the end of day six? Genesis 1, 31. God saw everything he had made. Behold, it was what? Very good. So, so get this. I want, I want you to get this. It's going to lead into the, the amazing thing that God does on the, the, the last thing he does, the last thing he creates on day six. Day six, God created the animals, God created man, God created Adam. And there is one thing that he hasn't, he didn't, that, that wasn't done yet. There was one problem. One thing that God said was not good. One thing God needed to wrap up before his creation was finished, and before he could say it was very good, there was one last thing that God needed to fix. And that was that man should not be alone. In order for, for God's creation to be very good, perfect, no flaws, absolutely perfected in, in, what, in what God created, Adam needed to not be alone. Basically, Adam needed a helper. So let's keep reading. We'll see what God does. We'll, we'll, read, uh, we'll read verse 18 again and finish it out. And the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called the, the living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the livestock, and to the birds of the heavens, and to the, every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So I said it's happening. Adam names all the animals. That's the reason why we have, I don't think all the animals, but I think species of the animals God named. I don't know exactly what he named or what, what, what he did, but God gave Adam this role to name the animals. And it's a clear sign of understanding, I think this is interesting, of man's dominance over the animals. Just like parents, uh, we name our kids, right? Same idea. Because what, why, why do we name our kids? Because we are the ones that are going to take after them for, for a period of life. We have dominion over our children. The same way as it, men have dominion or, or humans have dominion over God's creation. So clear sign of this is man naming the animals. Now I just love, though, how this text betrays Adam in the garden. All right, so he's alone by himself. He's naming all these animals, giving them every single name, one by one. He's naming them, and he's noticing every one of these animals are male and female versions of them. And then in this text, it makes it very clear in verse 20, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So he names all these animals, and he gets to the end of it, and he's saying, well, there's no helper for me. Like, I don't have somebody to, uh, to mate with. I don't have a counterpart in this life. Like the cats had a helper, the birds had a helper, the fish had a helper, the bear, the, the dinosaurs. And that's like, who believes dinosaurs and humans? Maybe, 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 maybe it's a burning question. You want to ask me why I think that. So uh, go ahead. But, but for Adam, there was no one to share this life with. No one. So Adam had no helper fit for him. Now, now what most of us do, and this is what I've always done when I, when I read this text. Most of us, we read this, and this automatically invokes in us this sad emotion for Adam, right? Like, oh, poor Adam, he's all alone, he's all by himself. Like, he's going to be forever, all by himself. And, and I always pictured, when I read this text, like Adam gets done naming all the animals, and he names them all, every single one of them, and he's sitting on a rock all by himself, just like, oh, man, this, this, really, this really stinks, man. Like, they all have somebody, I have nobody in this life. I always pictured Adam kind of crying and, and wondering, why, God, why? Why am I all alone? And even like, even like I always picture like God like praying or, or pleading to God, God, just send me a helper. Like send me somebody, send me a, a mate. But listen though, I, I actually don't think that was the reality of what's going on here at all. I, I don't I don't even know, and this is what I started thinking about this week. I don't even know if Adam realizes he doesn't have a helper. And if he didn't, if he did realize, maybe he did notice, you know, it's male and female. Why do I have a female version of myself, right? I don't think he cared. I really don't think he cared. And I fully believe this because I believe that all of his joy, all his satisfaction, it came from God. It didn't come from a helper or a mate. He, he, I believe that in Adam, on that sixth day, when he named all the animals, he was fully satisfied in God, not needing anything else. He didn't need anybody, he didn't need anything else in his life to make his life feel complete. Adam does not say anywhere in this text, man, I wish I had a mate. He is nowhere in this text you find Adam saying, man, I, God, please send somebody to me. Adam's not saying, I wish you had somebody in this life, a helper or a companion. You don't find that anywhere. 
There's nothing in this text that makes it makes us think besides our own emotions, because we know what, what, what loneliness feels like, right? But there's nothing in this text that makes it makes us think that Adam should be alone. It actually is God that says it's not good for that you be alone, right? God's the one that said that in the beginning. It was God that says, I'm gonna make a helper fit for Adam. Adam's not pleading for a wife here at all inside this text. Instead, this is where this is why I want to this is why I'm making this point, because I think this is actually an amazing thing to think about. Instead, it's God's like God saying, Adam, it's not good that you're alone. You might not even realize it's not good that you're alone, Adam, but I'm gonna give you one last thing. I got a gift for you, Adam. I got a helper for you, and I'm not I'm not telling you I have saved, this is what I want you to think about. Like God saying, I have saved the best for last, Adam, and it's for you. If you follow this, it changes the entire entire narrative, right? It's not Adam sad and all depressed. It's, 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 it's God saying, Adam, you don't, you don't even realize you need this. I'm going to gift you something that's going to change your life forever. I'm going to bless you with a helper in this life. And as far as we know, Adam has no idea what was coming. No idea. And as we keep reading here, I want you to notice how God creates Eve. And it's so beautiful because the way he creates Eve, and we, most of us know what's going to happen, right? But he, the way he creates Eve is filled with so much symbolism here. And I want to kind of just kind of uh, play off the symbolism for, for the rest of the sermon. Just, just think about this. So it's Q1 verse, verse 21. It says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of the ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought him to the man. The man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She, she, she shall be called woman and because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife are both naked and not ashamed. So God creates woman. We don't actually know her name. I, I, I'm going to use her name as Eve. We actually don't get her name in Genesis chapter 3, but her name would eventually be called Eve, and just for the sake of it, I'm probably going to call her Eve the rest of the sermon. So God creates Eve. Now let's just take, let's just, let's just think about this for a moment and look how God created the woman. Right, so he puts Adam to sleep. So Adam, you take a nap, right? Go over there, take a nap. And, and like I said, as far as we know, Adam had no idea what God was doing. Like this was a, and I, and I like to think in a way, it makes it a little more dramatic. Maybe, maybe it wasn't a way, maybe God did tell him what he was doing, I don't know. But I, in the text, we're not told Adam knew anything was happening. I believe this maybe was a surprise for Adam. I like to think it was. It makes it a little more dramatic, right? It makes the narrative a little more plays it out. So, so God says, you take a nap, right? Then, Adam, then, then as he sleeps, God performs this surgery. He pulls a rib out of Adam. And from this rib, God makes another human, a woman. And when Adam wakes up, there standing in front of him is a naked woman. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. But really, it was. Like, 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 you can imagine that Adam wakes up, and all of a sudden, it's like, there she is. And I know like, the, 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 the old the people always say this. Like when Adam says, woman, we must call the woman, because Adam's like, whoa, like, man. Right? And so that's why we got the name woman. I don't know, maybe. But anyway, he wakes up. Can you imagine this, right? He wakes up. Ah, nice nap. And then he sees, whoa, holy, whoa, what is this? This is awesome, right? And if, of course, I mean, anybody would think this, right? And, and, he, and he thinks immediately, he's like, shh. I, 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 I like her. Like she looks like me, kind of, but she's she's different. I mean, I know we're, we're so used to seeing like women, but you just imagine for a moment, like you you've never seen a woman in your entire life, and all of a sudden, bam! Like, whoa! Like this is such a different feeling for Adam. This is nothing. He's, this is nothing like he's ever seen. Like he's he named the animals, right? So he's all these animals. It's like you know, they're cute, they're fun. Like yeah, but this creation of God. Wow. He's like, and, and he noticed there's something in him, right? He's attracted to it. Like, this is something we don't even think about, but this is what God put inside of us, right? So, so God looks at him and he wants to be with her. He thinks, man, like, I, I want to spend my life with this person. Like, I, I actually like this. And, he, and he's feeling this, this sensation he's never felt before in his entire life. And this was by design. God created us like this, right? 
And just look how Adam, look, look what Adam does when he first sees Eve. He says, bone in my bones, flesh in my flesh. She was taken out of me. It's almost like, like Adam understood this immediately. Like God took a rib out of Adam, put it into Eve, and then he's bringing them back together to make them what? One flesh. Right? This, this is a soul. They said, notice the symbolism that's, that's built here. Like Adam had this innate desire to be one with his wife because, because, he, because literally wife was, his wife was taken out of him. Like this innate desire for them to come back together to become one flesh. And the woman felt the same way. They desired each other. They wanted to be with each other. Even in verse 24, it says, A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, the two should become one flesh. I mean, even, even you can see that, 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 that this, this whole picture of, of when, a, a, uh, 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 when children grow up and they leave the father and mother and they hold fast to wife. Like this leaving and cleaving. Even just the, the fact of the, the leaving of the rib, right? Going into to Eve and then them coming back together to become one. All of that is all built inside of how God created Eve. It's amazing you really think about this. The symbolism of how God created Eve is really amazing. God did not create women like any of the other living creatures. All the other living creatures were made from the earth. Out of the ground, God formed them, as verse 19 says. Everything, even Adam. Adam was made in the dust. Yes, God got into the, the dirt and the dust and molded man, which is, which is different than all the rest of the creation. But still, he's from the dust. This is only one of God's creation that was made this way. And why did God do this? To give us a foundation for marriage. For us to have a picture of what marriage is to be like. This passage right here in Genesis chapter 2 is, is, is referenced multiple times in Scripture. Paul references this when he talks about marriage. Jesus references, references Genesis chapter 2 when he's talking about marriage. And as I was reading this passage this week, and I was painting this picture in my mind, kind of what this, this would have been like that, that, that first day. That's why I was, I kind of imagine what it would be like, like all of a sudden seeing a woman for the first time and like, whoa, like, and then, so I, when I was thinking about this, what was that day like when Adam and Eve, Eve first met? I also couldn't help but think, what was like, what was it like the day after? Because any person that is married or has been married knows the honeymoon moon phase eventually wears off, right? Now, obviously, they're in perfection, so they had no fighting. They never, never fought until Genesis 3. We'll get to that next week. <laughs> um, they are going to start fighting. But until, until then, they had no fight. But, but still, like, what, was it, what was it like? Even after the fall, like, what was their marriage like? And there's no way to know for certain, but I want us to think for a moment of Adam and Eve's marriage. We're not given a lot of details, but what we are given, I think we can learn from these two. What kind of marriage did they have in the very beginning? What would their relationship look like? And I want to entertain this thought in order to gain a foundation for God's design for marriage and for us to help, help us understand what marriage is meant to be. And I know some of you aren't married here, but, but listen, this is even going to lead into uh, how God loves us. Like everything we're going to see today is it's going to apply to every single one of us today. But I want us to do this by, by looking at the symbolism here of, of Adam losing his rib in order to have his bride. Now here's the thing. One thing I, I, feel, I feel very confident that we can explore and know what this marriage is like because Paul in his iconic passage in Ephesians chapter 5, he already did this. The rest of the sermon, I actually want to be turning to Ephesians 5 to look at, because what Paul does, Paul actually basically gives commentary on Genesis chapter 2 and Ephesians 5. He helps us understand um, what this marriage would, would look like. And he gives us two uh, key principles, really, that Paul is going to highlight inside of this. And I think these two key principles are seen just in the symbolism between the, the rib leaving and, and of Adam and, and, and going and making Eve and coming back and becoming one flesh. So here are Bibles. Let's turn over to Ephesians chapter uh, Five, and I did not put the passion on the screen, so definitely look at the Bible. I want us to read this together. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. And I'm, I'm going to read the whole thing. There's a lot here, I know. And I'm not going to be able to dive into every little piece of it. But I, I want to read it all to get a context and then just break down two major things inside of the sex. So verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. As Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself a savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, 
as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that he that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast his wife, and two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So, yes, I know there's a lot here, but I want to just pull out two main things out of this, and, and from the context of Adam and Eve's marriage. So first thing I want us to see here is this. And looking at it from the context of, of, of Adam and Eve, Adam, in the very beginning, he saw Eve as his own body. Follow this? He saw Eve as his own body. Why do I think this is true? Because what, what did Adam say when he first saw Eve? Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She was taken out of me. He got it immediately. She, she, is, she is part of me. She, I, I, she's seeing her as a part of himself. If she suffers, he suffers. If she is hurt, he's hurt. He's, he's taking on everything, all of, all of her problems, all of her things. He's taking on, he's starting seeing Eve as one, as his own body. Adam understood that they were one and she was a part of him. And so Paul expands on this idea. And he does this by giving us some practical application of how we are to live as one. Because what does Paul say in verse 28? Husbands should love their wives how? Like their own bodies, right? He who loves his own body, well, so he who loves his wife loves his own body. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but he will, there's two things here I want to look at. He will nourish and cherish his own body. So follow this husband. I'll speak to you husbands for a moment. Adam saw Eve as his own body. Because of that, Adam would do these two things. Adam would nourish Eve. Adam nourished Eve. And what does it mean to nourish something? What, what do you do when you nourish something? You provide the things necessary for its growth. For instance, if you like to plant or if you grow a garden, right? If you want healthy plants, you want a healthy garden, what do you got to do? You got to water, you got to give them sunlight, you got to put them in good soil. You nourish and you take care of them so they will become healthy. Now, if you just think of your own body for a moment. We naturally do this, right? When we're hungry, what will we do? We eat. When we are tired, we go to sleep, right? There's so many things we do to our own bodies just naturally because we know we need to nourish and keep ourselves healthy. Nourishing ourselves is what we do to just survive. If you want to be healthy, if you don't want to have any major health problems, you're going to nourish your own body. So we think about this. Why would it be any different when it comes to our other half? Why would we think it would be any different that we don't need to nourish our, 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 our spouse? Husbands, if you want a healthy marriage, you need to nourish your wife. You nourish your wife. You must give her security, provide for her needs, and, and maybe even some of her wants. Even I would think, this is, something, this is something I think that's actually hard for me. I think that probably needs security, providing for her needs. But I think this is where men struggle. It means to also nourish her emotional needs. And so when she is crying, or she's upset, or she's anxious, or she's depressed, you pray with her. You comfort her. You come alongside her. You learn how to take care of her soul in those moments. And I'm going to emphasize this. You need to learn your wife. Study your wife. Because every woman is different. I know my wife is probably going to, she wants something different when she's in those times. And, and I need to learn. Every woman is different. I, I understand this. We need to know what your wife needs in those times. Same thing. I, I think about this, men. We will study things and we will learn things about our hobbies for hours. I have spent hours and hours and hours looking at decoy spreads for duck hunting, okay? Like, I've done this. Just learn how to do this. And, and I've learned how to build things. Or I've just spent hours on things to, to nourish things that I like, the things that I like to do. Men, spend even more time understanding how to nourish your own wife. And listen, I, 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 I'm not speaking as if I am perfect at this. I have failed nourishing my wife many times. I have failed nourishing my wife this week. You just ask my wife, she will tell you, okay? Like, I, I am not, I'm not talking from a place of a high, like I, I got all figured out. No, 
Like, I'm still learning this, and this is part of the fall. And I don't think Adam necessarily figured it out 100% after the fall. But still, we strive for this. We learn how to do this. We learn from our mistakes. And we say, okay, I need to nourish my wife and have this in our minds. When she's crying, when she is, is hurting, when she's what, go to her. Nourish her. Be there for her. Nourish your wife. The second thing Adam did, Adam cherished his wife. He cherished his wife. What does it mean to cherish something? It means this thing, this, this, it, you cherish something that's valuable to you, right? Something or someone that's worth protecting and caring for. Most of us probably have an object in our life that I guarantee we cherish. Whether that be a fairly heir, heirloom, maybe a gift that someone gave you. Basically, something, something that you have in your life, if you lost it, you'd be devastated, right? And once again, to think about this, we cherish our own bodies. We protect them from getting sick. We take measures to ensure that our safety in our, in our life. We wear helmets. We put seatbelts on. Like, if we were sick, we go to the doctors, right? We do this naturally because we cherish our own life. We cherish our body. If you don't cherish your life, what's going to happen? Your health's going to go down the drain, and you probably aren't going to live very long. And once again, why do we think it would be any different with our spouse? Husbands, you want a healthy marriage? Cherish your wife. Protect her, care for her, see her as the most valuable person in your life. More valuable than your children, more valuable than your friends, more valuable than anything, any other person's life. She is the most valuable person in your life, and let her know that's true. Pour your life into her. Do you see, do you see your wife as I believe Adam saw Eve on that first day? Think about that. That's why it's painting that picture in the very beginning. When Adam first saw his wife, when he first saw her for the first time, you can imagine his eyes just getting big. Wow! Like he cherished her. That was what, she was the most beautiful thing he's ever laid eyes on his entire life, and she knew that he felt that. Adam saw this woman as a person he wanted to spend the rest of his life with. That was the, Adam saw Eve as the greatest gift that God has given him. Do you see your wife as the same way? And the last point in a way, I'm going to throw a third one here from Ephesians chapter 5, that Adam, the, the, the most we learn from Adam. Adam also gave himself up for Eve. It kind of just brings everything together. Adam gave himself up for Eve. Can you imagine this? I just want you to think about this for a moment. The whole symbolism, the rib coming out and, and making Eve. Can you imagine Adam waking up from his nap? And found out that God took a rib from, from him to make Eve, and Adam was like, you did what? You took my rib? Like, I want my rib back, God. Like, come on, I, I don't want her. Like, she's not, like, come on, no. Like, I, I, I want something else, God. Can you imagine Adam saying that? No. That's ridiculous, right? Of course it is. And so is a husband not willing to give everything up for his wife. Man, you've been given a gift. If you have a wife in this room, you have been given a gift. You have been given a helper in this life to do life together, to have a family together with. And this is an amazing gift that is never to be taken for granted. Nourish your wife. Cherish your wife. Give everything up for her. Everything. Lay down your life for her. Even if that means you've got to give up your life, your literal life, to die for her. Do it for your wife. That's what you're called to do. She's worth it all, man. You know it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have got married in the first place, right? Love your wife just as Jesus loved us. I love the example that Paul gives here. Because the example that Paul gives, the type of love that husbands are to love their wife, is the same love that Jesus has given to you, his church, his bride, who humbled himself, who took on flesh, and all to sacrifice his life for us. If you're looking at that model for a moment, man, obviously we cannot live up to that, but that is our goal. We love our wife to the very end. Now you say here, what about Eve, though? Is she getting off easy? Like, what does she have to do? <laughs> like, man, you got to lay down your entire life for your wife. What, what, is, what, is, what is the role of the wife? And, and what is her role? Well, the thing about this, how did Eve treat Adam in their marriage? And I want you to follow me on this. Because in, in this text, we find that, obviously, wives would submit and respect their husbands. I like, like, fully believe this, though. I want to... Uh, play off this. Adam respected Adam because of his sacrifice. See this? Adam respected Adam not because he just because because he was her husband, but because of his sacrifice. <laughs> I want you to think about this moment. I want you to pretend you are Eve. 
right? You're Eve, you were just created, and you're created by God, and you brought to this man, the first time meeting him, you were told that this man gave up his rib for you so you could have life. He gave up a piece of himself in order to spend the rest of his life with you. What do you think Eve's response would be in that moment? Who cares? I don't care, whatever. Like, you think she just throw it away? Or say, oh, that's not enough, Adam. You could have given me more, right? <laughs> like, like, no. I don't think so at all. I believe, actually, she would have probably been in awe. Like, you would give up a rib for me? You would sacrifice that for me so you could spend your rest of your life with me? You would give that up so you could have me as your wife? And how do you think Eve would have treated Adam from that point on? Paul, I think, tells us in Ephesians, chapter, uh, Ephesians 5, very clearly, 521, wives submit to your own husbands. Five, uh, uh, Ephesians 533, let, your, let, let the wife see as she, is, she respects her husband. What would Eve's response be to Adam? Respect, submission. Does that mean she cowered down to Adam? Instead, it means she honored her husband because Adam is the one that nourished her. Adam is the one that cherishes her. Adam is the one that literally would give his life, lay down his life for her. He'd give her a rib for her, but Adam would go even further. If he had to lay down his life, he would do it for his wife. And Eve knew that about him. And she respected her husband because of the sacrifice he gave. I mean, think about this. Why do we give honor and respect to Christ? Is it not his sacrifice? Right? Dude, the songs that we sing, and even, even the, every, every sermon that I preach, is we always are going to tie back into how Christ sacrificed his life for us, how he nourishes and cherishes us, how he loves us. We're always thinking about that. Whenever we think about the honor and glory we give to God, we're thinking about the sacrifice he gave for us, think about his love that he has for us. And the same way is for the wives think about their husbands, they need to be thinking about that. The sacrifice their husband bestows upon them. And why did Jesus sacrifice his life for us? Why did God humble himself to come into his creation to right our wrongs? Why did Jesus die for our own sins? Because he cherishes his creation. He longed for us to be nourished, for us to be holy and complete, not lacking anything in this life, for us to be totally satisfied and complete joy. So God made a way for us to be with him by dying on the cross for our sins. Three days later, conquering sin and conquering death. So that all that call upon his name will be forgiven and will be with him, made new. Are you seeing the picture that Paul was presenting here in Ephesians 5? I want you to see this, this picture that, that, that is being presented here. When he says in verse 32, marriage is a reference to Christ and the church. Do you see this? I want you to listen. I want to bring this to an end. It's going to tie everyone in together to understand how important marriage is. Husbands. You love your wives as Christ loves us. You nourish and cherish your wife as Christ nourishes and cherishes us. I lay, I lay this out simply for you. Stop being selfish, man. Lay down your life for your wife. Put her above your own needs, just as Christ did for us. And wives, respect your husbands. Respect him. A husband that is loving you, a husband that is laying down his, his, his life for you, a man that is striving to cherish and nourish you. So you have the all that you need to flourish inside of this life. Just as the church submits to Christ because of his love for us. See this picture here? And I know I, we, I don't have time to get into this. I need to say, well, what about if my husband isn't doing this? Encourage him in that. The role is the same, no matter what. It doesn't change anything. Husbands, you do your role. Wife, you do your role. I'm not going to reverse it. You, you, wife, you respect your husband. Husbands, you love your wife as Christ loved us. Simple. And you see the amazing picture here we, that we have in Genesis chapter 2. The foundation that's being laid and is being set, and thousands of years later, it will reflect this one major thing in human history. The gospel. Yes. It's amazing to think about this. In Genesis chapter 2, we have an example of how Christ is going to love us. Or how Christ loves us. Marriage is always meant to display God's love for us. So I want you, I want to end with this, okay? Especially for us, one major challenge for us as Christians, and especially for your marriage. Let your marriage reflect and bring glory to Christ. That's what your marriage is meant to do. To reflect and bring glory to Christ. Christ. Husbands, love your wife so much that other men look at your marriage and they think 
that, that, she, that he must have the most beautiful, amazing woman in the world. Wives, respect your husband and submit your husband that, that in a way that brings honor to him. That other wives think that you are married to the greatest man in the world. So I want us to think about this. Like, how do we talk about our spouse around others? What, what, does our marriage reflect Christ's love for us? Like, really think about that. If, if, if marriage is meant to display the gospel, is your marriage displaying the gospel? If this is true, Christians, especially the church, just in general, I'm not necessarily saying in this place, but the church, the Christians in general need to start taking this seriously. Our marriages must be different than the world. It's sad that our divorce rate is no different than the rest of the world. That is really sad if you really think about that. Especially when you understand that our marriage, when we get married, when we say those vows, it displays God's love for us. So what does it say to an outside world that looks at our marriages that is supposed to represent Christ's love for us and we are ending them left and right? Is it any one of the enemy who hates the gospel is also going to hate the, the thing in this world that God created that actually uh, gives a picture of the gospel? He hates marriages, he hates your marriage, and he wants your marriage to end. He will throw everything he can at your marriage, especially if you're a Christian. So, I'm going to end with this. Fight for your marriage. Fight for your marriage, men and women, husbands and wives. If you're not married, then I would say to you do this. Pray for the marriages of this church. Come alongside them. Support them. So, so that we can see couples thrive. This, this is the most important, one of the most important unions that God has made in this world. And the enemy absolutely hates it. So, husbands and wives, fight for your marriage. And, and, and if you're not married, pray and seek a way to come alongside the married couples inside this place. And then as we move into communion, I want us, this, is the whole, this whole picture of the gospel, I want us just to reflect on this. As we remember Christ's love for us, we remember his sacrifice for us on the cross, as we take some time in this next few moments at the end of this, 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 uh, this service, to give honor and glory because of God's grace and mercy that he showed us. Before we take the Lord's Supper, as we always do, as it tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, we must examine our hearts. Repent of any sins we have in our life. And I want to focus on the married couples here for a moment. If you are married, I want you to say, I wanted to simply say this, repent. Repent. I'm bold to say that you need to repent because, husbands, you cannot love your wife perfectly. You cannot do it. The sin in our own life is always striving. I mean, there's, 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 there's a war going on inside your flesh, right? And it's trying to pull you away from loving your wife. So repent of the things that you are, are putting before your wife right now. Repent of it. I know. I, I, if you, maybe, maybe I'm just a wicked, awful sinner, but I know there's things in my life that I need to repent of. And I know there's things in your life you need to repent of that you are putting before your wife. Repent of that right now in these next few moments. And wives, same thing. You cannot perfectly respect your husband's as God has called you to do. So repent of anything in your life that you are not showing honor, anything you're holding back from your husband, anything that you are, are, are saying, he doesn't deserve this, repent of that. <laughs> and for us that aren't married, what I would ask you to do in the next few moments is do the same thing. Repent, seek the Lord. I know we all have sin in our life. In these next few moments, ask God to show you the wickedness, ask the Spirit to, to show you what things are, are keeping you from Him. And repent of those things in the next few moments. And after you do that, the way we do communion here, if you aren't new with us, um, you take some time, fans will come up, I'm going to pray, fans will come up, we're going to play a song. Um, in that moment, before you take of the bread and the juice, take some time and pray. Take a few moments by yourself, pray. After you have prayed, after you confess, after you seek the Lord for forgiveness. Then come up, take the bread and the juice, go sit back down. One of our elders can come up and lead us on the kingdom together. So let's uh, start with this. Pray. Father God, Lord, I pray that you would refer us in these next few moments as we just examine our own hearts. I pray you would show us the evil that is there, the wickedness and the sin that we have there. But I pray for, for the husbands in this room. 
the husbands that, that, that honestly, Lord, you give us a huge call to love our wives as you loved us. But I pray for the husbands in this room that they, they would take on that call. They would take, in these next few moments, they would examine their own hearts and repent of any evil, anything they're putting above their wife. And I pray for the wives the same thing. Help us to be a humble church, Lord. Help us to be a, a, a church that, that would just it, is confessing our sin, that understands we are not perfect, Lord. We are striving more and more each day to be more like you. God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that we can, we can, we can pray to you, that we can seek you. And for anybody that is not here right now, that has never given a life over to you, Lord, um, especially before we take communion, I pray that right now they would seek you. They pray to you. And Lord, right now they would have a relationship with you, God. Lord, thank you for what you did. Thank you for, 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 for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. And we love you. Just don't pray.